Hello everyone, my name is Bartosz Józefowski. I'm working with Krakow Technology Park um, uh, on the startup side. So uh, apart from Digital Dragons, everything with the games, we do also stuff with uh, IT companies. We have investment fund, we have the uh, acceleration program. And this is how I got into this job today uh, because um, our guest, Paul is uh, known in the uh, startup ecosystem, I would say, and in Poland uh, also. Uh, and I'm super excited to be able to also introduce him to the Polish game, uh, Polish game ecosystem. Uh, because, Paul, you, you had today an uh, important announcement. So let's start already with that. Um, yes, yeah, so today um, we announced our fund called Smoke Ventures obviously inspired by Krakow. Uh, I remember as a kid growing up, uh, coming visiting here, and I love the Wawelski Smuck. I thought it was one of the coolest things ever. Um, so yeah, me and my partners who are sitting in the front row, Boris, Diana, and Dan, um, yeah, we've uh, been working this fun kind of behind the scenes uh, for a little while now, and yeah, today we announced it. So we're going to go out there investing in top awesome new young companies in Poland. Um, it's pretty vague. It could be anything from, you know, self-driving cars to you know robots to people doing e-commerce stuff to obviously video games um we're especially very interested in video games being that have a history in games and been involved in the game industry in some way shape or form for over 20 years now uh, awesome um i'm checking the time because like if you will be talking in the pace like that we will finish in 20 minutes <laughs> okay i, I could i can elaborate more of course. Yeah, yeah yeah awesome yeah. so uh, uh, i would like to start with your connection to poland and uh, it's um uh, i know that you speak a little bit polish <laughs> i don't know uh, uh so so tell us more yeah so um we're just supposed to um we post is a but um yeah i mean so i grew up in chicago um you know typical polish american mm -hmm. family uh immigrated you know a couple of years before i was born um and yeah so i grew up really getting to tech and so um you know in the kind of age 15 16 i got really into kind of uh, technology art kind of video games all type of stuff um and then i got connected um into a thing called the demo scene demo center if you guys some of you might know this um and yeah from there that's kind of when i first started getting plugged back into poland right because i had relatives here like some you know second cousins or my babcia but then she passed away right but like but then yeah so through the demo scene i got plugged into a lot of really amazing people and actually some of my friends from 20 years ago are in the audience as well today um so yeah we started working on really cool stuff and just working on cool graphics working on cool you know programs and stuff and then um after university i was like i want to start a company and um yeah and what am i gonna do i want to make video games that was my dream as a kid and so who do i call i, I messaged my friends here in poland because we had a you know, good relationship they were super awesome super smart building really cool things and we kind of started building stuff. So, um, yeah, me and uh, a guy named Pavo here in the, in the middle here, uh, we started making games on Game Boy Color in 1999. Um, and, yeah, we, we started a company here in Poland, actually, in uh, Wrocław. And we made, I'm pretty sure, the first ever console game in Poland history on the Nintendo Game Boy Color. And, um, yeah, it was quite a big deal. And so that's kind of where I started getting more and more connected to Poland. Uh, I started, you know, coming back and back more often. I even spent, I think, eight or nine months living here in Krakow one time trying to practice my Polish, which I totally failed at. Um, and um, yeah, so I just kept on getting more and more plugged in. And I got really excited because Poland to me, I mean, obviously I'm biased, you know, because I'm Polish heritage, but there's amazing talent here. There's amazing engineers, amazing artists. And yeah, I always thought to myself, okay, so I'm this guy that's born in America. I'm kind of this bridge between both worlds. Maybe I could kind of help you know, connect Poland into some of these people. And yeah, we started doing that. And I've been kind of, you know, coming back more and more often. And, now with the launch of Smoke, I'm gonna be here, I guess, considerably more often. And yeah, we have a team here full time also looking for stuff. And I really want to kind of help Poland become even more relevant and bigger on the not only game industry but just tech side in general because there's so many awesome people doing great things here. It's super nice that you are saying that even more relevant uh, for, for many people. It's <laughs> only starting to be re relevant. I, I understand that from your perspective, Poland's already like interesting. Um, a business partner like yeah i mean so this is how i see the polish industry for games but it might be tech in general right so poland is super well respected in america um people think of poland as like one of the best engineering hubs in the world right like i mean like 10 years ago people didn't think about it but then i remember friends like oh yeah i'm gonna go to india and china for outsourcing i'm like what the fuck are you guys doing why don't you guys go to poland right and then they started working with polish engineers and polish teams are like oh shit these guys are awesome and i think the really big difference between that and other parts of the world is poland was always 
kind of culturally relevant to Americans, right? Like, uh, you guys watched a lot of the same cartoons, you guys, you know, pirated the same video games, uh, you guys were going out there and, you know, you know ripping DVDs and shit. Um, and so, like, but, but it was culturally similar, right? And I think a lot of my friends also, you know, shared a lot of interests as us Americans do, and I think Poland is always kind of American, Western-focused. So... I, people started recognizing that and like, okay, we can work with these teams. And if I tell you like, a reference to some cool movie, you'll get it. Versus you tell some uh, reference to some guy in some other countries, like I never saw it. So, um, so yeah, people in America started really realizing, hey, there's awesome teams in Poland. Um, and yeah, so some people first started kind of just using Poland as outs kind of an outsourcing hub, and that was the beginning, right? And you're like, okay, you pay your dues, and but yeah, now over time, Poland's kind of standing on its own legs. It's like, why the fuck do we have to work for somebody else? we could go out there and start our own company and be truly world-class level. And mm -hmm. I'm seeing it happening more and more. In the last five, 10 years, a lot of amazing companies have started. And I think that's only the beginning. I think we see a lot more super awesome companies coming out of here that are gonna be you know, global giants. And that's, that's my hope. And that's why I'm here and you know, investing time and money here. Awesome, it's, it's interesting to think about this cultural similarities. I, I never thought about that, but it's, it's really super true. Important. Yeah, yeah. I mean, seriously, if you go out there and talk about some cool cartoon to a guy in India or China or whatever, he's like, I never saw it. But here, like, yeah, I got it, right? And like, um, that's really important when you're involved in a creative and technical industry like the game industry, right? The game industry is like the coolest industry because it combines art, music, programming, design all together versus, yeah, like if you just want to, you know, get like a farm of people grinding away on some, you know, data entry, yeah, you could use anybody in the world. But that's what makes Pwn really magical, especially in the game industry, so. Awesome. Um, you are starting the uh, investment fund, uh, 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 Boris and Diana, they are from Reactor X in Warsaw. Uh, Boris also had his own startup, so uh, they are easy to check. Uh, whenever I'm thinking work with startup, I, I always say do the due diligence with your investor, the yeah. same that they are doing to you. So check their colleagues, check uh, who did they work with, uh, stuff like that. So Boris and Diana, they are easy to check. They have the uh, long history in Poland. Uh, who should we look for in Poland to check you? So uh, could you give some names, people you worked with, uh, those uh, Game Boy yeah. game I mean, games? Well, anybody in the first two rows, pretty much, <laughs> right? <laughs> okay. um, but um, no, I mean, also, like, I mean, um, I've been working with a company called Vivid Games. Um, so I know the CEO, Remy, for also, I think now, 1995, so what, 24 years, right? Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of the other kind of top Polish game dev CEOs have worked with me. But also, if you reach outside, I mean, you could reach out to a lot of the companies I've invested into or, or inv you know, been advisor to. I mean, you know, companies like, you know, I guess you could say Unity or Small Giant or, you know, other. I'm also, like, really plugged into Finland and Nordics. So if you find game developers out there, they could ask them, like, hey, how's it working with me? You know, is Paul an asshole? Is he nice? Is it a mixture of both? Um, but, yeah, I'd say that's kind of a good start. Yeah, <laughs> thanks for the tip. Um, so now let's talk about uh, details of your investment. So um, how much money uh, did you raise? What is the size of the por portfolio? Uh, what is the uh, average ticket size you would like to invest in, uh, in the companies? Uh, and, uh, and what stage of the, uh, like the growth company yeah. should be to, to be interesting for you, as yeah. a, especially in games? I'll answer this in two parts. Um, so one, I mean, globally, I have a little bit over $400 million in managing. Um, we're investing all around the world, be it from Asia to Africa to Europe, et cetera, and obviously Silicon Valley. Um, for Smok, um, this is a first-time fund. Um, you know, we're launching it small, you know, kind of minimal viable product. We want to get it out there, test the market, see how it works. So we launched with uh, 46 million zloty, uh, a little bit more than 10 million bucks, I guess. And um, yeah, so we're looking to go out there and put company, put money into companies at a I guess relatively early stage. So you have like a prototype, maybe you launched a game or two in the past, you kind of looking to take it to the next level or you're looking to put money in to kind of buy more marketing and ad spend. And you have pretty good metrics, we can put money into that. Um, but yeah, the verticals we're looking for, um, like I said, it's pretty vague, but you know, kind of initially, we wanted stuff in games. Um, I also have a very strong history in uh, VR and AR. I also have a separate fund that only focuses on that. Um, and then yeah, we're also looking for you know, just general tech companies, um, but maybe it's not as relevant to you guys, but um, yeah, so I'm just looking to work with the best companies. 
or best new up and coming companies that have global ambitions. So let me qualify this. Like, I don't want people who want to make small games. I want people who want to build a company, right? Like, because I know some people want to go out there and make a cool game, right? And that's awesome. And I think everyone should do that. Um, and some people want to stay indie as, you know, indie as fuck. Um, but like, some people want to build a true company, right? They're like, hey, I want to go out there and build something that's me, you know, played by hundreds of millions of people. I want to go out there and, you know, hire a marketing team. I want to have, you know, PR. I want to have. So if you're looking to build a company in that kind of scale, then we're very interested in, you know, how do we go out there and get into the next supercells? Or like in my case, you know, I was investing in Small Giant. I mean, these are companies that are, you know, multi-hundreds, if not billion dollar valuation. That's what I want. And I think that should be the ambition of Poland. I think Poland should be like, hey, how the fuck do we make billion dollar companies here? We have a few already, right? You know, we got some of the old school ones, but like of the next generation, we got to take it to the next level. Okay. Um, you, you, you've already mentioned it, um, your, your investing history. I think that this is um, uh, truly interesting. Uh, so, so small giant, but I also saw Unity on your list, uh, Uber, uh, Zappos. Uh, first, uh, first question is, uh, how did it happen that you were able to invest in them in yeah. the early stage? So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, so I guess I'll step back into my history. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned, I got in the game industry in the late '90s. Um, I got really plugged in. I met some amazing people. Um, after that game company, I actually moved to Silicon Valley in 2004, or sorry, 2005. Um, and yeah, that's when I got really plugged in. So I luckily had some good friends I've known for many years. Uh, even some people from the demo scene were doing cool things in Silicon Valley. I plugged in and I just started meeting a lot of really cool people in San Francisco. Um, and so this is after the dot-com crash. And so it was the beginning, it was a thing called Web 2.0, right? And this was like, I guess you could say like nuclear winter. So in Silicon Valley, everybody had left. Only the really, really hardcore people were left. And so I showed up then. I was like, this is cool. I don't care if there's no money to be made. I want to be involved in tech. And um, yeah, all the people in the scene there were just doing really cool stuff. And we kind of all grew up together. Um, I was really well known for kind of hosting dinners and barbecues and stuff. So I kind of became the glue for a lot of people in Silicon Valley. A lot of people met through me. Um, and yeah, through that, you just meet smart people. And one thing that's really cool about Silicon Valley is that people help each other out a lot, right? So when my friend needed connections into, into investors, I helped him out. When I needed help to investors or to resources, people helped me out. And so we just started helping each other all out. And yeah, some of these people became super amazing people, right? I mean, I could probably tell you a story about every single company if you want, but um, uh, yeah, it, it just kind of evolves from that. And so like, I'll give one that's really relevant. So let's say Unity. How did I get involved in Unity? Um, so Unity, I mean, that's a... 25, 24 year old relationship now. It's a guy named UC Lakonen. So UC uh, was an old demo scene guy as well too. Uh, he was in a group called Future Crew, if anybody knows what that is. Um, and um, yeah, so UC was like, I'm gonna start a new company and I need help in Silicon Valley with connections. I was like, cool, no problem, right? And so yeah, I just you know, introduced him to like 25, 30 venture capitalists and stuff. Um, and then yeah, his company kept on growing. And eventually his company got acquired by Unity, right? And so then David Helgeson, well, the former founder, uh, he, now he's a board member, he bought his company. And yeah, so through that, so me being involved in UC's company then got me into Unity and I was able to kind of get involved in the whole community. And yeah, so this is random. Like deals come from all over the place. It's not like I sit here and get people send me applications, right? No, you build relationships. You kind of get to know people. You see how they're operating. You're tracking them over you know, a couple of years, if not five, 10 year period. And then you're like, hey, you're doing cool shit. I would like to put money in somehow, or can I get involved, or can I help you, right? And yeah, so with Unity, it was me just being helpful to him as a friend, and then he's like, hey, Paul, I love you, I want you involved. And so it's like, I'd say with anything, especially in the kind of Silicon Valley, it's like, give first, and then ask for stuff later, or don't even ask any, for anything ever, sometimes people just grant it to you. And um, yeah, so that's kind of how it works. And I, I wish I could say there's a formula, no, it's just you have to be kind of really present, you have to be really helpful, be a good part of the community, and magic happens. Awesome. Uh, so there, there are plenty of stories, as you said, yeah, yeah. and usually uh, people share uh, what, what works and uh, what I'm interested in is it, what doesn't work. Yeah. So looking at the, the, your experience and the, the, those companies that you were involved in, uh, could you share some major fuck up or, yeah. or maybe a story that you, you were like everybody was expecting the success story, yeah. especially in the maybe games uh, and yeah. it didn't work. I'll, I'll answer two quick parts, right? Um, one thing that doesn't work for my job like, is like, if I look at companies only with kind of numbers and analytics and kind of look at a company in an abstract way, that does not work in the early stages. That might work if you're super late, you're 10 years old, you're trying to optimize stuff. But like in my stages, you have to really focus on people. And so once you get to know people, then you can make a decision. So if you only focus on just like, 
okay, he's got this, 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 and he's got these numbers, you probably will not make for a good investor because you have to be, you have to go more into it. There's like a soul to the company. There's cultural values behind the company. You have to really figure this out. Um, what was the second part of the question? Like how I, what doesn't work for the companies? Yeah, what's big major fuck ups? Um, yeah, I mean, the biggest reason companies die is because founders fight each other, right? So like companies, what I've seen, what's cool about the game industry is if you survive, there's a good chance you could become a big company eventually. Like almost all the big game companies went through some really shit times and they didn't quit. And it is, so if the founders are together and they're constantly fighting for each other, trying to help each other out and not giving up on each other, I think the chances are very high that you'll find, you know, some kind of hit over a five, 10 year period. I mean, look at even some of your biggest game companies here in Poland, right? CD Projekt, Techland. I mean, these guys were around forever and some of the stuff they made in the beginning was complete shit, right? But they survived. They kept on pushing. They kept on, you know, growing new people around them, hiring smart people and they survived and they didn't give up. And so this is the case everywhere. Like let's say Supercell in Finland, right? Um, yeah, you see only the Supercell story, but there's a 15 year journey of the founders working with each other at previous companies like Digital Chocolate and Sumeya. So these people didn't give up on each other. They really believed in their kind of talent together and they kept on going forward. So, um, but yeah, the biggest reason companies fail is because people quit, people fight each other and say, fuck off, right? And um, yeah, so if you could avoid that and you could create a good culture in your company, you go out there and get people to kind of believe in you, your vision, then you're gonna have a, you're gonna succeed. I guarantee you, if you don't give up, you will succeed. Uh, I believe that the quote about the CD Projekt Red and Techland, yeah. it's, it's, it's good for my media. Yeah. <laughs> Look what they've done before. I mean, I'm shit. pretty sure that they will agree with me. Their early games were pretty bad, right? <laughs> yeah. So yeah, yeah. Cool. Or they're doing pirated magazines or whatever, right? So obviously yeah. very different uh, beginnings, right? So yeah, yeah, it's true. Okay, so. Um, you will be investing here in Poland in tech, but you are investing uh, globally, so uh, it seems that you can be an uh, awesome bridge for companies from Poland to US. I imagine that even without convincing you into investment, you still can be very like helpful for companies, so it sounds uh, uh, reasonable to, to talk to you uh, <laughs> after, after this uh, fireside chat. Uh, but I wonder, um, there's a little but in this whole story. You have huge connection to US, uh, but there is a, a huge world outside of US and Europe. This is, there's Asia, uh, Africa, that is really interesting as a uh, uh, direction for companies. There is the whole Latin America. Um, um, do you, s when you talk about global company, you always think about uh, Europe then scaling to US and when you succeed in US, then you are a global company and everything other clicks? Or do you, do you see other directions for companies, especially in games? I mean, no, I mean, I think um, the market's huge everywhere in the world and it continues to grow. And there's rising middle classes all throughout the world, being in Asia, even Africa nowadays, you said Latin America. Um, so I, if you asked me this question 10 years ago, I would say you have to come to Silicon Valley you can only, you have to, no, I'm not even single, you have to focus on launching the United States market and capturing that, right? Um, in the last, you know, 10 years, for sure in the last five years, there's been an explosion of people wanting to consume things, right? Obviously, everybody has a mobile device nowadays, uh, you, know, you know, the video game industry keeps on growing, you know, console penetration keeps on going everywhere in the world. So, um, yeah, you could go out there and target different markets. I mean, I've seen certain companies that, you know, they tried to launch in some country in Europe or United States, they failed. Then they kind of pivoted and they found a huge user base in like a Malaysia or something like that. And so um, now that being said, some of these markets are harder to monetize in, right? Um, if you have a shit ton of users in Myanmar, which one of my companies did, you can't monetize these people. Actually, they cost you money, right, to host them. So, um, so you have to figure out how to, uh, you know, tie things together and make sure that you're focused on the right, you know, I guess like, don't get off the path just because you get some users in a place doesn't mean that's necessarily the best for your business. But um, but yeah, like when I say going global, it means like, yeah, like think outside of Poland, think outside of Europe, think world fucking domination. Like there's no reason why. Like like one thing I, I noticed, you know, being Polish myself, you know, even holding a passport, like Polish people tend to be kind of shy about their ability. They're like, oh, well, we're good, but uh, you know, we've had a hard history, blah, 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 right? I think that's fucking bullshit. There's no more excuses anymore. It's like, we should be as good if not better than anybody out there. And so I really truly believe in that. And so, um, yeah, how do we all gain the confidence to go out there and you know make sure our games and our products go everywhere in the world? I will give you, you guys a time for questions um, in a moment. So write down something or think about questions you want to ask the poll just to um, 
just go into the direction that is especially interesting for you. Uh, I will continue with my scenario for oh, a moment. Oh, bring it on. Let's yeah. do it. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, short, simple question. Why so many investors avoid g game dev? We don't see in Poland VCs that have uh, in their strategy games. Uh, why is like that? I mean, yeah, it's something I've thought about, right? And so for me, yeah, my friends think I'm insane. Um, actually, I'm probably one of the most active game investors in the world. I have over 100 game companies in my portfolio. Um, and yeah, I don't know why more people don't do it. Well, I do know what kind of, but like they should be doing more of it, right? I think it's a couple of things. One, people are chicken shit, right? Um, Two, I see a lot of similarities between, let's say, technology and then like the divide between Los Angeles and San Francisco. So some people invest in technology, some invest in movies, right? So people don't know how to evaluate a good game, right? So if you're like a random venture capitalist, let's say all the Polish VCs, nobody actually has ever spent time in the game industry that I know of, right? So if you've never touched a game industry, you don't know what it takes. It's really hard for you to evaluate something, right? It's kind of like if you drop me in and said, Paul, start investing in movies, I'd be like, fuck. I don't know what I'm doing. So, um, so yeah, historically, almost nobody in the, in the venture capital industry actually has experience in video games. So I think that's one. Um, two, people say it's a hit-driven business, partially, but it depends on how you look at it, right? If you go out there and build a portfolio, if I invest in 10 or 20 companies in the game industry, well, I'm pretty sure some of the winners will pay off for the losers, right? So you have to kind of get your head around that versus like, I'm gonna bet all my money on one or two companies. Um, also, I think there's another reason people don't invest in the game industry is that because a lot of people in the game industry don't want to build big companies, right? A lot of people are here to make cool games, but they don't think about the business aspect of it, right? So a lot of venture capitalists don't take these companies seriously because they're like, oh yeah, this is basically amateur hour and it's kids you know, making fun games, ha ha ha, he he he. Versus like, hey, why don't we go out there and actually build a real company? So I think if more people in the game industry kind of took the attitude like, I want to go out there and build a powerhouse company, that VCs would come in more regularly. And I've seen kind of phases in the game industry um, where VCs do get excited, and it's because mostly because some kind of new platform comes out and people take this kind of business first mentality. But yeah, I know, like a lot of developers, especially indie guys are like, hey, you know, that's gonna corrupt my game. And so yeah, you have to make that choice. Do you wanna go out there and build a big company or do you wanna stay indie? And both routes are totally cool, but you won't get VC money or investor money if you wanna stay indie as hell. Okay, so, um but, but what is the lesson for people here in the room? Uh, so let's say that I'm doing the game uh, like with a group of friends. We, we know each other. We worked uh, th through years. We, we believe in this title. Um, we can go to the publisher. They, they will probably give us some money, then some publicity money, just uh, some uh, difficult deal to make. Uh, or we can go to you, but the, then uh, what do we have to change in our mindset? Like, so what, what do we... Well, you have to think, are the, you independent? The pitch, what is yeah. the pitch? Uh, I mean, so you have to think, I mean, first you have to change your mindset, are you independent or not, right? So when you work with a publisher, you're basically their bitch, right? And <laughs> like, you are gonna, they're gonna screw you over, they're gonna, you know, they're gonna tell you what to do, right? Or like, you have to fit by their schedule, their marketing, whatever, right? Now, if you choose to go truly, you know, build a business kind of on your own, independent of a publisher, um, then yeah, you have to kind of have different plans, right? You have to have like a you know, couple year plan. You have to have a vision of how you're gonna grow this company. You don't, don't think about one game. You think about, I'm gonna make one game, then we're gonna you know, launch two more teams out of three games, five years from now. You have to think you know, many years out how you're gonna go out there and build it. Now, whether you hit those targets, that's a whole different story. But like, when you're pitching to investors, you say, hey, I'm trying to build a big company here. I'm not just like a guy's like, like if you come to me and pitch like, Paul, I wanna make a really cool you know, side-scrolling pixel retro game, I'd be like, I don't give a shit. Now, if you said, hey, Paul, I want to be the leading guy to make cool retro games. Um, we're going to go out there and create a portfolio of 25 games. Um, we're going to do this over a three-year period. We're going to first start with, you know, kind of knockoffs of, you know, old Nintendo games. Then we'll expand to other things. And we're going to go out there and target this age group. And, okay, these guys have thought about this. They're not just some random people making a cool game out of passion. They actually have a systematic plan. Now, we all know plans all fall apart. But it's more that you've thought about it. It's more that you've made the planning. It's more that you actually are trying to go out there and build a cohesive vision that you and your team can be behind. And that's the big difference. So thinking longer term, thinking bigger, thinking more systematically. And I know that's sometimes contradictory because games is art sometimes, right? But like, how do you go out there and build it in that way? And the biggest game companies have done that, luckily. They've been able to keep their identity, but also have this kind of whole professional, um, I guess, system around them. Okay. Uh, 
So basically, you've kind of also answered my, my, my next question So about other options. So business angel or crowdfunding, like this is kind of like decent way of uh, fundraising your project. But then this is fundraising the project, not the game, uh, not, not the business. Yeah? yeah, exactly. So that's another thing people always ask me like, hey, Paul, can you invest in our game? I'm like, no, I can invest in your company. But so what is your company? Is it one game? Then I'm not interested, right? This also goes back to the how do you make sure, like people, why, why people don't invest in the game industry? Because you invest in one game, you have a chance of losing all your money, right? If I just invest into a company that wants to make 10 games, it's a portfolio of games, right? And I'm hedging my bets and I'm potentially, uh, you know, okay, lower risk of losing. I still might lose all my money, but I'll have a lower risk. Um, so yeah, it's important to go out there and, yeah, but like you said also crowdfunding. I think all these things are great, right? Because also, as a game developer, you have to practice your art, right? And you have to go out there and get good, right? So how do you go out there and buy time? So if you can find somebody that's going to sponsor your project in the beginning days, or you do get some crowdfunding, that's great. And maybe you spend the first year or two of your company kind of doing this stuff and getting a couple games out there. And then maybe you wake up one day and say, hey, I want to go out there and build a big company. Let's make a perfect example, right? Let's say Epic Mega Games, right? I mean, I know these guys since the old demo scene guys as well too, right? And yeah, I mean, like, Dude, it was like Tim Sweeney and fucking, you know, Arjun Bruce and a couple of these dudes making games in their respective parents' houses, right? They had no major plan, um, but then over time they kind of, you know, okay, let's go out there build an engine. Let's go out there make more games systematically. Then they even took in some more money to become, you know, a major powerhouse. So you don't necessarily have to become a professional company from day one too, right? You might kind of dick around, do some cool stuff for a year or two, and then you're like, yes, we want to go all in. When you want to go all in, that's when you talk to me. Uh, if you guys are still not sure, then we can be friendly, but I won't be able to invest at that time. But it's, it sounds incredibly difficult uh, from the perspective of psychology of people who do yeah. games. Like when I people uh, hear that they are colorful, they appreciate arts, they, yeah. they, they appreciate being original. Yeah. Uh, in, in the business world, being original is not necessarily the, the, the biggest value. It's the consistency, uh, you know, uh, having planning, stuff like that. So, so no, th I mean, this is, I think you, you, both, you are right? grabbing this art, like how, how to no. create a team, like CEO. No, no, I mean, like, uh -huh. you, I mean, some of the best kind of tech guys are originals, right? You know, the Steve Jobs, the Elon Musk, they were originals in their own ways, right? Yeah. So you can be fucking crazy and weird as fuck, uh, but still be somewhat uh, methodical, right? And actually, anybody who ships a really awesome game has to be methodical. I mean, do you know how much planning goes into making a game? It's crazy, right? So you already are doing it in the pursuit of your love of your, you know, the game you're trying to make. So it's just more like taking it and extending it a little bit, right? So hiring people around you. You can go out there and hire a business development person. You go out there and hire a COO. You can go out there and hire people around you, right? But like the best games, I mean, some of these projects are like, you know, five, your projects, the amount of plan, planning and product management and the kind of systematic way of building it, it's already there. And so game industries already have that, um, that discipline. The game industry already has a discipline, super and mega, mega, you know, scores, right? And like the game industry is like two and a half times larger than the movie industry. It's huge, right? So it's not a matter of discipline. It's more like just adding one more step on top. of it. Let's think as a company, let's think a little bit larger than just that one game. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that it's difficult to, to, to learn that. Like, uh, who should we follow? Like, do, 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 could you name like people? Uh, I don't know who, who who can we read or yeah, watch? So or? The, I would say it's not about reading game industry stuff. It just read tech companies in general, right? I mean, like, there's so many blogs and you know, I guess you know, articles and stuff out there. Um, but people are just building companies, right? This is building a company. It's not building a game company. It's building a company. So you could follow the, yeah, the, the any of these big major famous guys, you yeah, know, the, cool. the Ubers, the PayPals, et cetera. They all build big companies. Everything that they did can be applied to the game industry, and a lot of times it already is. Okay. Um, let's talk about opportunities also, because uh, as you said, the games and AR, VR, a, a, uh, artificial intelligence, it's, it's very vague. Yeah. So um, in games especially, uh, do you see any opportunities like, uh, you know, uh, console games, uh, mobile games, casual games? So, so is there any trend that you would uh, especially like uh, recognize yeah. right now? Um, so, yeah, I mean, we try to go for platforms that obviously have, you know, huge scale, right? So historically, they've done a lot of stuff in mobile gaming because it's kind of very casual. You can make a lot of money that way. Um, that's very hard to break into now, right? The amount of money you have to have to kind of spend to kind of get yourself up on top of the charts is pretty difficult nowadays. So um, so I'm always now looking for what are new up-and-coming platforms that are coming out 
that you could potentially launch into and kind of take advantage of the kind of the beginning of the curve, right? So look at, let's look at some of the biggest mobile game companies. Let's say the Supercells or Rovio and stuff. They started kind of as mobile and iPhone kind of came out, right? So I'm thinking to myself, what are other big new platforms coming out? So there's going to be some other new console. Um, obviously, I think it's really important, like AR, VR. Yeah, we're going through the trough, but I think we're kind of coming out of it now. So can you like invest just as that platform itself is about to explode, right? And so, um, yeah, we want to find companies that are looking for maybe new platforms. And I think that's always an opportunity because when there's new platforms, there's no competition. Look at the history of video games. Almost all the top video game companies were created on top of a platform being launched. It wasn't like they show up there, you know, 10 years of the life cycle and put something out there. They kind of got in there early and then they've kind of popped after that. Okay, uh, AR and VR, uh, 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 this is like difficult to grasp because right now I see a lot of uh, games companies that switch to industrial solutions, so their skills, yeah. uh, doing uh, um, uh, augmented reality uh, products, it's r really uh, looked for in the uh, ad tech, it's stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, uh, do you really see a moment to go back to the, to the games right now? So. No, I mean, I or, think, or maybe having that two legs in the No, I think it's both, right? So when I say AR, VR, stuff like that, I think the opportunity is both, right? So one, obviously, some people will choose to stay in games, and as that platform matures and there's more devices sold, they'll become a sexable game company. Um, but also, yeah, what's really cool about the game industry is the talent that the game industry has is super invaluable for everything now, right? So, like... When you do games, you inherently start doing stuff around computer graphics, computer vision sometimes. You also start doing stuff around, you know, versus, you know artificial intelligence. I mean, look at um, DeepMind. That's a former game guy, right? Like, the game industry actually produces some of the best, best people. Like, almost any game, any almost big company in the history of technology has had some people with roots in the game industry, right? So, yeah, if those people pivot away from the game industry because they find a really cool opportunity in you know, uh, let's say yeah, industrial applications, that's super cool. And like the more the talented people from the game industry even go into other industries, I think it's a huge win. And um, but yeah, you can you can name almost every big company ever created in tech, and they have some kind of connection to the game industry. You guys can even quiz me; I can probably come up with a story for everyone. <laughs> yeah. I, I I totally agree. I, I, I love all those gurus in the tech industry that are saying like the storytelling is the most important part right now. Yeah. Yeah. You need to invest in storytelling or user experience is huge right now. Yeah. So basically uh, understanding the perspective of your uh, user when in the games industry is uh, kind of obvious true that it's, it was always there, the, the storytelling, the, the user experience, the focusing on the client. Yeah. Uh, th th this is what, like how hook, hook him up into using the product. So basically uh, the, all the skills are already there. Yeah, that's what makes it. That's once again what makes the game industry awesome, right? The game industry is this combination of so many different diverse talents, right? Uh, if you're building a boring, you know, I don't know, like database company, yeah, you just need some database guys and some engineers and maybe some sales guys. In the game industry, yeah, you're combining, you know, artists, programmers, musicians, you know, cool, you know, the design. It's 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 such a cool combination of so many different talents. Which also makes it very hard to make a hit game. But when you hit it, it's amazing. It's magic. I, I, uh, when all those people meet, uh, I, I've participated in a few uh, jams, like uh, hackathons yeah. for game developers. I, I see that there is always um, uh, the, the question also ab about the theme or topic. You know, like uh, th there's when when there is a jam, like hackathon, there's always like five or six games about zombies or <laughs> stuff like that. So, do you, uh, do you also have any tips how to look for those? pop cultural trends, uh, like, you know, uh, fo following uh, the plans of big uh, movie companies or something like that. So how also uh, uh, the game developer should uh, uh, choose the, the team, the topic? This is just the, the, your heart telling yeah, you what... I mean, <laughs> so for me, I'm pretty dumb when it comes to picking a theme, right? Like, uh -huh. it's like, I'm not going to be like, okay, this year I'm going to invest in only in zombie games. Like, if I did that, <laughs> I, I'd, I'd be fucked. Um, but, no, so, like, I... My job is to kind of go out there and meet as many companies, and then I kind of synthesize what is coming up and what's interesting to them. And so, yeah, if I start seeing a lot of zombie games, maybe that's kind of pop culture, and maybe I want to invest in one or two of them. Or, yeah, maybe some hit show is already doing something that maybe the, you know, the people are kind of gravitating to, you know, kind of post-apocalyptic whatever stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I myself don't ever want to dictate the themes. I kind of let the creative people do that, and then I kind of react accordingly to what's kind of being produced yeah, in the game industry, the movie world, etc. Okay, so so the last buzzword to, to, to get uh, closer to uh, uh, artificial intelligence. Yeah. Um, so uh, 
what of what opportunities in the AI do you look for? Uh, it's I, I feel that this is right now super super hyped uh, uh, and and not I don't know many companies that really make money out of it. So yeah, it is a lot of hype. So a lot of people just slap the word fucking AI on there. I'm like, oh great. I mean, yeah, most companies don't even know what the hell they're doing, right? They're gonna oh, I downloaded TensorFlow and now I'm an AI company, right? Um, so no, most people who are talking about AI are full of shit. Um, but now. There are some people doing really cool things there, and you could apply it onto some, you know, kind of more legacy or old school industries. Yeah, there's potential to do a lot of really cool things, and it, also very few industries have huge data sets where they could actually, you know, have AI learn on top of, right? So, um, but that being said, I, uh, some great people I know from the game industry have gone an AI route, and they done really well because they were creating kind of more kind of rudimentary AI in their games. They kind of started experimenting with other tool sets and did really well. So. Um, but yeah, uh, in general, whenever somebody says, I'm doing an AI company, I take it with a grain of salt. I'm like, what are you really doing? Okay, and then you're layering AI on top of it. But it's not like, oh my God, you're an AI company, I have to give you money. No, okay. definitely not. Okay. Um, let's, let's kind of wrap up this, uh, this, this fireside chat with a question about your personal experience. I don't know if you know, guys, but uh, Paul have, uh, has uh, quite interesting stories about his Olympic uh, Olympic, uh, uh, um, let's say, adventures. Yes, uh, uh, <laughs> I, I loved when you kind of worked with Colombia to to have a citizenship there, to just to be part of their uh, ski team. Uh, um, could you just say a few mo a few words about your experiences in that? And uh, uh, was it like learning experience, or this was just fun? You, you um, I'll answer the longer version, but quickly. Yeah. Yes, huge learning experience. I learned so much about myself and also the world in doing this, and I'll get back to that. But um, yeah, I mean, very quickly for you guys, um, I had two dreams as a kid. One, I wanted to make video games, and two, um, I love the Olympics. I think the opening ceremonies is like one of the coolest things in the planet. Um, so obviously I went down the video game nerd route, and I was not a great athlete, right? I was actually okay at it, but I, was, I never pursued it seriously. Um, and then about six and a half years ago, when I was 35 years old, um, I decided, well, fuck, maybe I should try to go for the Olympics. Um, <laughs> and um, yeah, so I tried. Um, so I went out there, I'm very analytical, um, you know, kind of engineer, but a really bad one. But um, yeah, I just read the rules of every single sport in the winter and summer Olympics. Um, I found out there's a couple sports with flexible rules. Um, these sports were downhill skiing, cross country skiing, bobsled and luge. I flew around the world, tried every single one of those sports. I picked skiing. I've never touched skis in my life before. Um, and I started skiing every day. Um, I found a really amazing coach up in Finland. So I moved to Finland above the Arctic Circle for one year. Uh, and I skied every single day for three to five hours a day. Um, needless to say, I got jacked and I got really fucking good. Um, and uh, yeah, but part of the equation is also I could never make it as an American or Polish citizen. We have really good ski teams here. Um, so how do I optimize my chances? Well, you find uh, a country that doesn't have a ski team. And so um, I um, wrote letters to over 100 countries and used my various contacts. And through friends of friends, um, I got to meet the president of Colombia. Um, I pitched him on making me a citizen of Colombia. Uh, he politely agreed. Um, obviously, this is like a way shorter version. Like, they could, I could do like a 45 minute talk just on this. Um, and yeah, so I became a citizen of Colombia. And well, they didn't have a ski team, so I started a ski team. What happens when you start a ski team? Well, you become national champion by default. Um, and so I am, yeah, you could say from 2013, 2017, national champion of Colombia uh, before I retired. Um, and so when you're national champion, you don't qualify for the Olympics, but you qualify for the Olympic trials. Um, and yeah, I participated in the Olympic trials, uh, you know, 10 races all across Europe. I even did one race here in Poland. Um, I ended up missing the Olympics as an athlete. Um, but then I started getting really involved in the Olympic spirit and kind of helping athletes out and kind of connecting them and stuff like that. Um, and then through my work there, I actually I became a coach uh, for uh, the Olympic team. And I actually made the Olympics in winter sports as a coach last year in Korea. Um, so yeah, happy ending. But I said, lots of twists and turns. But yeah, like we said, what did I learn? I mean, this is a fucking amazing experience, right? One thing I learned, humans are awesome. Um, and what I mean by that is like, you could do anything. I could go from fat computer nerd to 
basically top level athlete to back to fat computer nerd um, in, in a matter of a year, right? So you, the mental ability to go out there and train and kind of transform yourself is amazing. So, and it's not only for sports, like you could become a you know, world class pianist, you could go out there and become an artist. I think anybody in this room could do whatever the fuck they want. You have to just kind of have a plan, right? Um, two, people are awesome uh, in that like people are helpful. Like, my story does not help. That my story does not happen without my coach from Finland, without my friends making connections, without the Colombian president. Like a lot of people gave me gifts of their time, of their resources, of citizenship. I mean, like that's the craziest gift I've ever gotten. Like who gives you citizenship, right? It's, it's like so. Like people are really nice, and so but people are only nice um, if you have big dreams, right? If I went to somebody and said, "Hey, yeah, I'm looking to finish a marathon," they'd be like, "Good luck," right? But if I said, hey, I want to fucking go to the Olympics and I'm sucky and like I'm going to try so hard and, and people see you trying, people want to help. Like people are attracted to big dreams. People want to be part of a big dream, right? And so now my goal, and what is my job as a venture capitalist? I get to go out there and be part of other people's big dreams, right? So some of the companies you mentioned, like the Unities and Ubers, I'm super proud of that because I was able to help my friends just a little bit to go to the level. They're the ones who won, but I was part of their story. And like, so everyone who helped me was part of my story and I wanna be part of other people's story. So like, that's one of the reasons why I do my job is because fucking 10 years from now, I wanna have a beer with you when you sell your company and say, ah, oh, we did it, that was fucking cool. Um, so um, yeah, so it was a huge learning experience. It, it was a lear learning experience about me as a person, how far I could push myself, but also just on the human condition and how humans work and how people you know, react to things. Yeah, and I came away way more positive about the world than I even was. I, I'm a very positive person. I was even more positive than that experience. Fantastic. Okay, guys, th th this is the time for you. Do we have questions? Yeah. You could ask me anything. It's very open floor. Thank you very much. It was an amazing talk. And it's like, I, I wanted to ask you mostly um, about uh, Niantic, the, the story. Like, did you felt, um, if you can, of course, talk about that. Yeah. Like, did you invest in them in the beginning when you felt it's going to be a blast or you already f it's gonna, it was already visible that it was a blast? It's going to be a blast? Yeah. Um, because I'm, I'm a fan of these games myself and yeah. I was, I'm very interested how the other people, like you, for example, felt about them. Thank yeah. You. Um, so when I invest in companies, I mean, I have high ambitions that it might be big, but I'm doubtful, right? So I'll, I'll give you an example uh, of a company that's not in the game industry, but it's a really big one that you guys know. So I got involved in Uber early, right? And so how did I get involved? I mean, I got involved because the former founder, CEO, Travis, is a good friend of mine. He started a company. He asked me for some help, right? I gave him some help. I helped introduce him to a few people. And you know, we, I got involved in the company as a result. Now, did I see Uber becoming a billion dollar company? Maybe. Did I see Uber becoming a seventy billion dollar behemoth that has three billion, you know, three million drivers around the world? No fucking way. Uh, yeah. Niantic. She was asking. Oh, sorry. I, I, was, I was just giving an example. Yeah, but um, yeah, like with Niantic, um, I'd say there was a little bit different story, right? So that was we put money to a company. And then Niantic acquired them, so I didn't even know I was going to be putting Niantic, Niantic, right? And so we kind of backed into Niantic, right? Um, but once we got it, I mean, we were super happy and you know, really excited. But, uh, but yeah, so that, that same, the path is unknown. Sometimes you come to a company directly, sometimes you come to a company kind of through a different angle. So yeah, that was a different story, right? And the, every story is there. So some are like, yes, I believe the founder, I know him. There, I didn't even know the founders. I knew founders that they acquired, and then you kind of get to know people. So awesome. yeah. So yeah, different paths for every different company. Any questions? I think that um, through all those histories, yeah. I, I think that you you may uh, seem a little bit intimidating for people. <laughs> like, really? I thought I'm very approachable, <laughs> okay? I mean, besides my look, I look like a fucking caveman, but like, um, <laughs> you, yeah. <laughs> you, you, uh, actually, this is a very, uh, very, very, very nice talk, and I, I think that you are very approachable, but, but still, I think that this is a very new concept. Yeah. Uh, uh, VCs investing in games, this is kind of a new creature for Polish uh, game developers. You are not from here. People may be kind of intimidated. That, uh, that, that's why I would like to, at the end of this talk, a kind of, uh, uh, s stress out those guys doing selfie right now. Yeah. Uh, I want Boris to stand up and Diana to stand up and Dan. Uh, that is the the, uh, the part of the uh, Bragel brothers. Uh, but Boris and Diana, please stand up. You are th th these are the guys to talk to if you kind of uh, need a proxy to talk to. <laughs> yeah, 
if you feel that you need a, 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 a touch movement do lepi po polsku right <laughs> yeah, so yeah. no but like yeah i mean so yeah like i'm busy i'm flying around a lot if i'm in town i love to spend time i'll be drinking with all you guys tonight i think there's some big parties going on right yeah. um so yeah no i'm approachable i mean like yeah let's have a beer together it's super simple but yeah if i'm not in country um yeah boris and diana are amazing they're an extension of who i am here um they can answer questions for you um you know they're, they're be part of the community they don't come from the game industry themselves but they want to become more uh, i guess integrated into it because they know how how important it is in poland right and so um and how important it is in uh, in our investment uh future so um yeah no please don't be intimidated um yeah i mean i i was the same shoes as you guys I still am, right? So who knows? Oh, there is a question. <laughs> Good. Yes, don't be shy. Can I have two of those? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah bring it on. So uh, okay. first one is uh, do the games that you are looking for the companies do they have to be innovative games or just like a good products with a vision for being like a cool yeah, company? Yeah, I'm fine with I mean like let's say um okay, so I was a small giant, right? I mean it's kind of like you know match three puzzler. Is that innovative? Fuck no, right? But they executed like machines, right? And the team before um, they ran a company called Habo Hotel, uh, a company called Sulaki, which made yeah. Habo Hotel. So it was a great team um, that was starting a company, and then they that was actually their second or third game. They kind of but the game was not super innovative. I mean, there are some of the things they did in the game, but like actually like, gameplay wise, no, it was not. They just did it better and they executed like machines. So, so it's the team. Yeah. So, so it's, yeah. yeah, team's important, but also yeah, you don't have to necessarily create something brand new actually a lot of times you create something so radically new people take time to kind of get it so they're like but if you take something that's really kind of well established and you make it a little bit better sometimes it's more grokable for people in the game industry cool so uh you've done game dev you've done olympics what's the paul's next big dream i don't know i um <laughs> i'm searching for the next big one um in general i, I want to grow this investment you know funds like I, I really want to go out there and be involved in like potentially you know hundreds if not more thousands of companies around the world like I think that entrepreneurship is super powerful I think the way people approach building companies is super enabling and also like yeah how do we as people not work for somebody else but you know create our own kind of dreams um so yeah I don't have a dream per se that I'm kind of focusing on right now besides building this company um but yeah I want to be part of other people's dreams so how do I become like a multiplying factor right people help me can I help multiply people and help them grow faster toward their dreams so maybe that's kind of the dream to help others because i've gotten a lot of favors maybe some time for me to give back more yeah <laughs> thanks <Yeah>. dude <laughs> awesome this is digital dragons 2019 we have uh, something around 100 talks and we couldn't avoid some fuck ups the one is that we uh, kind of messed up with the schedule that's why we are right now at 1 a.m talking to each other uh yeah. Uh, PM. It might be one AM in my head, though, right? Uh, yeah, it's it's kind of is. So so that's why we had to change. But I'm I'm super happy that you came to to hear this chat. That we had the opportunity to talk. Uh, and congratulations for Smog Ventures. So please join me, uh, thanking Paul for this uh, chat. Thank you, guys.